Thank you. I didn't even test my sound. Are you good? Yes, I tested it for you. Okay, thank you. It's, it's only a recording, not amplification, so you'll need to speak up. Oh, I will. I have no problem speaking up. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. I am so glad to see familiar and unfamiliar faces here for our discussion at length about difficult clients. Not only about the difficult client, but more importantly, how to avoid getting difficult clients, how you deal with them, and all those kinds of things. I will talk forever. I've asked my monitor over here to give me a 10 minute showdown, but I hope you find the information both helpful as well as entertaining. By and large, we have great clients for the most part, right? They bring interesting projects to the table. We learn things from them. They learn things from us. It's a mutually respectful relationship for the most part. But I've learned over years and years and years of <laughs> attending WordPress camps and WordCamp meetups that the people we talk about when we get together are not those wonderful, ideal clients. Who do we talk about? Whoa! Yes, golly! We talk about these guys, right? The ones that cause us to pull our hair out and we just groan in agony. You won't believe, right? So part of what we're going to do today is talk about not just talk about the clients. We're going to talk about the personas that a lot of clients fit in with us and the reasons why we want to deal with them. One, we want to keep our hair, right? <laughs> We're talking about the situations that cause us a lot of stress. The situations that rob us of the joy as to why we went into business ourselves. I'm assuming that if you're in this room, Almost all of you are self-employed freelancers, have some sort of relationship with clients, right? That's who I got, right? Okay. Um, we're talking about the situations where someone is argu arguing with you all the time. They're pushing back. You say left, they say right. Okay. Um, we're also talking about situations where you don't get paid either because the payment is slow or because they refuse to pay. This all sound familiar? I see a lot of heads going, yeah, uh-huh, preach it, lady, we know, yeah? Um, and then there's those situations where they just do the damnedest stuff, don't they? They just, it's just crazy. They do something that makes no sense to us. In short, Difficult clients are costing us money, right? Okay. Let's talk about penny pinching Paul. Now, I'm old and I know who this is a picture of. I, I'll, let me rephrase that. I'm not old. I've lived a long time. Okay. For those of you who are a lot younger than I am, this is Jack Benny. A notorious, well-known penny pincher. And if you Google penny pincher, as I did when I was looking for images, that one came up, okay? Now, the face of your penny pincher might look very different. But these are the situations that come up where every invoice is scrutinized. I don't understand why you billed me for three hours. It was just a simple thing. Okay, right. I mean, it, you can read for yourself. They argue about every little detail. Um, I'll flip my notes over. In the beginning, Paul might seem very professional and well put together, but over time, that pushback becomes an irritant. Can I do what? Oh, yes, it is, isn't it? Let's see what I can do with that. I don't have a clue. 
you'll just have to live with it. Uh, it, it probably has something to do, but it's not going to be important. Oh, these are all available. Yeah, it's, I'll tell you how to find it. Um, yeah, it's it, because the screen is expanded here, it has to so do something with how the resolution I'm marrying, and it would take me more of time to figure it out than to just keep going. Okay, so who has a penny pincher? Oh, my gosh, every hand is raised, right? All right. There's some other types of folks we deal with. There's one that I refer to as Emergency Ellen. Oh, got that too. Yeah, everybody has some of these. My Emergency Ellen starts every subject line of an email with URGENT in all caps. All the time. Doesn't matter what it is. It's always urgent. Um, another example of the urgency is they give you a call on Monday to discuss their newest brainstorm of a project. And by Tuesday afternoon, they're sending you emails about the status of it, right? They tend to think, not that they are your only client, but they are in that urgent mode, right? They think, I'm going to mention it to you, and you're going to clear your calendar, and I'm going to work right ahead, right? I'm, okay, I'm having to read my notes today because my brain is shifting from having been an organizer to walking in this room. But, <laughs> so, so no matter how many times you try and set the expectations with emergency, Ellen, maybe I'll do this. You know, you email back, I work this way and I work that way. They just never hear it. Does that make sense? Does it sound like the people you're working with? You know, it's just, awesome. yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, these are not mutually exclusive. Right. Yeah. Right? right. Um, let's take a look at Terrible Terry. Oh, gosh. Terry is... <laughs> <laughs> Terry is a bully. Likes the sound of their own voice. They enjoy standing on the shoulders of other people to make themselves look taller. This is the person, if you, if you have a team, this is the person that all emails and phone calls are ignored by your team and deferred to you. <laughs> Y'all got some Terry's in your clientele? Can you that last part again? Uh-huh. Um, you and I work together. I, I'm on your team. I get an email from Terrible Terry. I forward it to you. Phone rings, caller ID says, Terrible Terry. I don't answer. Okay. Terrible Terry is the one who keeps you awake at night because you are in fear of th their wrath. You know, um, it's not beneath them to belittle you and publicly and loudly. And so a lot of your decision making is tempered with what's he going to say? Okay. Sound familiar? Y'all have got some of those, right? Okay. This is, this is a nightmare client, not just a difficult client. Oh, and my favorite, Stampede Sandy. I'm sorry, Sandy. It's definitely not you. Uh, it's also not the name of the client that I you know, had in mind. Um, oh, my gosh. Have you, this is a real segue. Have you ever sold a house that you spent a lot of time landscaping and it's gorgeous and three years later, you know, you've sold it and you drive by and they have mowed down every damn thing you put up? Okay, that's Stampede Sandy. You have delivered the website to them. It's gorgeous. It's functional. And then one day it's just not. Stampede Sandy leads us as designers and developers and very proud of our work to make them 
not an admin. We don't give them the full rights to their website for fear of them going in and messing things up. Do y'all do that? Do you keep total control of your website? We can talk about the pluses and minuses of that, but it's this character that, cr that creates that in, in us, right? Um, my stampede Sandy looked like the ideal client when we met. We spent time in discovery, and it was a paid discovery process. I mean, not $200, it was much larger than that. And we spent hours and hours and hours scoping out the project, and we were in agreement, and we were rocking along, and then we would present the functionality, and then it wasn't right. And we're miscommunicating, it's like, we're not matching up. Cut to the chase. Here's one of those clients that really thought that they wouldn't have to do anything. I want this high-end functionality, but I don't want to have to touch the buttons to put in the data entry. Okay. Yeah. And some of that stampeding at the end was me on her. Okay. Here's my picture of stampede Sandy. One of our favorites. How many people are wait, have a project, they're waiting on the client for content? Oh yeah, lots of hands. Mm -hmm. um, more than a year? Anybody waiting more than a year? Two years? Yeah, there, there was a little bit of this. Uh, when I was talking in Raleigh, uh, the hand stayed up for a long time. We got to three years. They're still waiting on content. Uh huh. Well, there's something wrong with us. I mean, yeah. Okay. And we got, that's how we prevent some of this in the future. I love this guy, Waffling William. Waffling William couldn't decide to go out the front door or the back door if his pants were on fire. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're trying to get feedback and input from the project and keep the th whole project in the middle of the road, right? Well, I kind of like red. But then blue is really nice. What do you think? I think you ought to make a decision is what I think, right? It's, they just won't agree or confirm to anything. And we let... Until, I don't know about y'all, I'm good at passive aggressive. I grew up in the South. Huh? And so I make the decision, yeah, bless your heart for sure, which is never a kind thing for those of you who didn't grow up in the South. Um, yeah, we'll talk about what that really means later. But with Waffling Williams, I make the decisions for them. Well, of course, that's not right. You have to go back and redo it. But at least a decision had been made, and I was doing something. All right. No matter which nightmare is in your client repertoire, they all have some things in common. They don't respect your time. Okay. They uh, constantly are checking up on you as if you're just going to take their money and disappear in the night. Sometimes with reason, because you're their third person they've worked with, and the first two did take their money and run off into the night, but uh, they might be expecting results you can't possibly deliver. That was my situation with my stampede. You know, she was expecting a fully landscaped four acre plot of land and was <coughs> paying for, you know, a subprime lot. Okay. Um, how about this? They believe that they can do a better job than you because they have a computer science degree from 1993. Does that sound familiar? You know, those are, and it goes hand in hand with the, I don't understand why you billed me for three hours 
it should have only taken 15 minutes, okay? Well, we all know that that doesn't work. And of course, there are those who haggle over everything, regularly pay late, or refuse to pay at all. But no matter how they present, the steps for managing them are much clearer. Let's see where I might be in my slides. Oh yeah, here we go, I'm on time. Okay, the first thing is stay calm. It is very hard to stay calm when terrible Terry is blasting you as loud as possible. Okay. But it is our job, we're the ones being paid, we're the ones who say we're the professional, so it is on our shoulders to stay calm and set the tone of the conversation. It is a well-documented fact that if you are calling and ranting at me and I begin to rant in return, that is only going to escalate. But if I begin to slow the pace of the conversation, take pauses so that I can take a deep breath and listen carefully, then the person who is on, in communication with me, if Terry is ranting, he eventually will start to mirror my tone and my pace of conversation. If not, you can always politely say, this doesn't seem to be a good time, let's schedule another call, okay? I'm not encur encouraging you to stay on the line with somebody who's being abusive, okay? My daughter gave me a call the other day. Now, my daughter is a grown woman, and she's been having to deal with a government agency for six months trying to get something resolved in relation to her dad's estate. And the first tier, we've all had this with customer service, first tier is, you know, really putting her off, putting her off. Well, she sent me a text the other day, I said, I got a verbal reprimand for my abusive language. So, you do not have to tolerate abusive language. I'm not asking you to to put yourself in a relationship where somebody's abusing you. But it is our job as the professional to stay calm and take control of that conversation, okay? We want to listen carefully to their concerns. Active listening, which is a thing, which means I am actively paying attention to what you are saying, and trying to understand where it's coming from, as opposed to immediately jumping into my brain how to respond and fix it, which is hard for us. We like to solve problems. We're addicted to solving problems. So slowing that pace down also helps us to listen, listen carefully. Um, not just difficult clients, but people want to feel heard. They want to feel acknowledged and recognized. And in the process of me slowing down and paying attention, I can hear what they are not saying. Does that make sense? I'm reading between the lines. I can come to understand that why they are reacting the way they are reacting. It's usually emotion driven. They're scared. They feel betrayed. They don't feel acknowledged. I mean, there's something. I mean, think about your own personal life when you get, when you become a difficult client. None of y'all are difficult clients, are you? <laughs> yeah, right. Me neither, okay. Um, my client that starts every um, subject with urgent, is also prone to say things like, nothing's working. When you say nothing's working, can you help me understand what that means? <coughs> Everything's broken. Well, when 
you say everything's broken. Can you show me? Are you in front of your computer now? Can you show me what's broken? That also gives them something to do that takes them out of the situation. And you begin to drill down because what everything broken means to them is certainly the whole damn website's not down. It's not the white screen of death or they would have started the conversation different. But I need to, to ask great questions. And I can only ask great questions if I am listening carefully and being calm. I also want my responses to be prompt. Now we've already talked about how nobody wants to handle Terrible Terry. He's our nightmare. And so when that email comes in, I save it for later. And the next thing you know, it's in your e inbox and it's drifted down and it's been three days. That ain't cool. Because what happens if I wait three days? They get angry. They get angrier. Uh huh. It doesn't fix anything. So, the common courtesy of a prompt reply. Um, our job in this conversation is to figure out what the hell happened. Where did this go so wrong this time? What is it in this situation? Where, I mean, because I need to understand. Sometimes it's a technical thing, right? Sometimes it might just be a bug. But bugs don't make people difficult. It's usually an emotional issue where somebody expected one thing and got something different. It's a breakdown in communication. So I really have to figure out where did it go off the rails? What could I have said differently or done differently to prevent this? Has anybody had a relationship with a client where when it was all said and done and you wrapped it up tight and neat, you went and revised your contract? Yeah. Yeah. I give you a quote today, but I don't put an expiration date on it. And two years from now, you come back and say, I want to move forward on this quote. Oh, man, I certainly got to revise that stuff, right? So it's a learning experience for me as the professional as to how I need to change my behaviors in response to the work that I deliver. Um, someone asked me earlier this week, can you tell me about a project that went off the rails and what you learned from it? Do you ask that question of yourself when things go off the rails? You know, it's, yeah, some of you do, some of you don't. If I am going to grow as a professional, in my field, then I need to take these circumstances and put them on my shoulders and evaluate it. What could I have done differently? Okay. We want to offer a solution, not necessarily a quick fix, and it's also not about admitting that you were wrong. Oh, I'm so sorry that happened. Maybe I am, but I need to understand what happened before I start saying I'm sorry. In my first life, I was a therapist. And I would ask my therapy clients when they, you know, some people just apologize for everything, you know. They, you run into them and they say I'm sorry, right? In order for me to be sincerely apologetic, I need to know what I'm apologizing for. What was the real offense? So don't start out of the conversation going, I'm so sorry this happened. You want to go through this process first. Okay. If you're in the wrong, admit it. You don't want to put the blame on your client, even if they are the one who made the mistake. Do y'all ever do this? <coughs> you're writing the email back to this person, and they've said, blah bitty, blah bitty, blah bitty, blah bitty. And you say, I know, that's because blah 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 And you're trying to 
educate them, you say, and teach them. What you really want to do is explain why you did what you did, that they really are at fault, but not me. That doesn't, that doesn't play well. Doesn't play well. You cannot change people's behavior unless they change the way they think. It's one of the things that Chris said right off the bat this morning, you know. Just because you believe it's true doesn't mean it's true. I like to teach people. And so a lot of times I find myself constructing an email response that is, well, I did this because that hooks to that, that goes over here and leans on this, and therefore, clients don't care. They just want their stuff to work, right? Okay. Um, again, back to communication breakdowns. And sometimes you can convert a difficult client to an okay client and maybe even groom them into a good client, but that's not usually what happens. Okay? Sometimes you just have to fire the client, and that's okay. And there are ways to fire clients, and I'm going to tell you some of them. It's, you get really good. First, you want to check your contract. To make sure you have a clause in there that says it's okay for me to fire you. And it's okay for them to fire you. Oh, yeah, I see that face. Um, it's just one of those things in there. I am a business owner. You are a business owner. You are not a waitress at IHOP. You want five or you want eight in that stack. But when that first phone call comes in with your client and they're asking for a website, way too many of the clients I work with, my coaching clients that I work with, start with, well, how many pages? Do you want a slidey thing at the top? Do you want a big hero image? Do you want this? Do you want that? And we start taking orders instead of stepping up. But anyway, um, check your contract. Is it okay for me to fire you? You want to not leave them hanging, wind up the important work that you've got on the table, and then refer them somewhere else. Okay. It's hard to do that the first time. It is really, really hard to do that the first time. One of my professional colleagues and I have been in communication for well over two years about a difficult client that they have. And she has finally, in the last two weeks, gotten comfortable with saying, I'm out of here, okay? Let's take a look at some conversation starters we can use in our emails when we reply to them. We're moving in a new strategic direction. You own your business. You do not have to explain to them what that direction is, why you came to that conclusion. You only need to let them know how it's going to impact them. For example, someone told me yesterday, she said, we've decided in our agency that we no longer offer one-on-one -on -one training to beginner WordPress users. Nothing wrong with that decision. It's just a, the decision they made for a variety of reasons. And as a result, blah, blah, blah. I need to refer you elsewhere, right? Does that make sense? We've decided to move in a different direction. We're streamlining our business and have, decide, have decided to... Yeah, pretty much. Uh -huh. In a nice way. We're going to say that. It's, I don't want to work with you anymore. But again, it comes back to you taking responsibility for your business and eliminating the difficult clients that are not converting, that are robbing you of your joy. Here's a good one. This is very easy. We're increasing our fees. 
Some clients will choose to come with you at the new rate. Other clients will choose not to. Has your waste management company ever explained to you why your rate's going up? You just get two sentences. Effective March 30th of 2020, your rates will increase by to this number. Love you, miss you. Bye. You know, thanks, regards, but okay. We don't have to explain our business decisions to our clientele. And that is very, very difficult for most every freelancer I have ever met, ever. Whether it stems from, I want people to like me, I want them to understand, I don't want them to badmouth me when they go away. That's, that's all doo-doo between our ears, okay? Here's one of my favorites. We're phasing out your service plan. I wrote this email myself just before I came here. Don't need to go too far in depth about the circumstances, except that it is a client that a year ago, or coming up on almost a year ago, um, they pay their retainer a year in advance. And off of that retainer, I ultimately installed a whole new theme, rebuilt their website, didn't charge them extra, but they ate up every minute of those 30 minute tasks that I was offering them as part of their service plan. Okay, lady who's been on the outs of that relationship for a while, comes back into it, ready to work on the website, and wants to know how many hours she has left in last year's retainer. Uh, I stipulated that last year you paid me this amount of money, and then I did this, which was a $2,500 value, and then I did that, which was a $1,500 value, and blah, 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 and therefore there's n no time left on that for task, and it, renew it expires July 31st, okay? And then I said, since we negotiate, since the during the time that we last negotiated that plan, we have changed our rates. It now costs this, and I'll outline what is there. The response I got back was, thank you, okay? Now, Come July 31st, I'm going to roll it out, and I'm going to say, here's your new plan. You either pay it or you go away. I don't, I don't care. I don't care. But it's hard to get that email started. My friend who terminated the relationship, the one we've been trying to terminate for her for two years, started with not this one, but with, I've changed my business plan. Okay. The biggest takeaway in dealing with difficult clients is to begin to slow down the onboarding process. Spend more time in that first conversation. In that conversation, you want to be asking why questions. Why do you want a website today? Why didn't you do it six months ago? What would happen if you waited six more months? What you're trying to discover is what is the true underlying motivation for why now? Don't start with how many pages do you need? Ask great questions in the beginning. And in order to ask great questions, you have to be doing what? Listening carefully. Spend a lot of time. It will slow down your cash flow in the beginning when you start transitioning to a slower onboarding process, but you will get better clients. The fact that I have difficult clients is my fault. Every time, every single time it's my fault. Maybe you are a hanger on from when I started and was not confident and therefore I was charging you nickels and dimes and now I resent it, whatever. Slow down your process, uh, change your pricing structure, Prioritize your list of clients. Call the bottom 25% every single year. Every single year. Take away those. Because the bottom 25% of your clientele 
is costing you 80% of your time, energy, joy, and probably money. That is a documented thing. I mean, you can find one of those curvy things and it'll have a fancy name that supports this. This is a known fact. Get rid of the bottom people all the time. Do it every year because I am not the same woman that I was this time last year. I am not the same business owner that I was this time last year. My life has shifted. The clients that I attract have shifted. People that did not irritate me day before yesterday just bugged the hell out of me today. <laughs> that worked for y'all? I mean, <laughs> life changes and you need to change your, ba your business accordingly. That's all I got except to tell you how to find me. That's all my things. I do lots and lots of stuff, but this is not a commercial about me. This is just ways to follow up with me. Uh, we've got a few minutes for questions. Yes, ma'am. I'm waking up as well, but this is really healing and helpful, so thank you. Um, two questions. Uh, one of your strategies for kind of deflecting or phasing out client was uh, to say, we're moving in a new strategic direction. And then you said it's probably good if we refer them to someone else. What if you know this is such a malicious, evil client that you don't want to burden other people that you know you're doing by them? Is there like another play around? Okay. That? Okay, let, let me stick with that one first. Um, but, yes, I am. Uh-huh, because I need to condense that question for the video and for the transcriptionist. In short, what you said was, one, one of the comments that I had made in terms of terminating a client was to refer them elsewhere. Except when, as you asked, what happens if they're so horrible that you don't want to inflict their pain on anybody else. Mm -hmm. And do I have a solution for that? I do. You stop the conversation right after saying, effective this date, we will no longer be able to work with you. I wish you much success in the future. Really easy to say, very, very difficult to write. It's, I, we're done is what you're saying in a more professional flavor. Does that help? Yes. Okay. And you had a second question? Yes. Um, when you're saying that you have increased your rates, if you know, um, <coughs> sometimes I have sliding scale depending on if they're a small business or a nonprofit or if they're like bigger. So if I give them, tell them these are my new effective rates, does that have to somehow be the ones I Oh, that's a great question. When, and when it comes to quoting rates, tell me your first name. Hanel. Hanel uh -huh. is saying that she has a, a sliding scale depending on the client and the circumstances and budget and all those kinds of things. But it raises the question of, if I offer you a dollar twenty-five and I sell it to you for two fifty, and y'all talk, what happens? Oops, it's awful. You you got something, Judy, to add no, to that? It's a sliding scale depending on what their needs are and what have you. One client's needs is not the other. If they're the social, if they talk and they ask about it, then there would be the the situation of. Your needs were different, and thereby the pricing was different. Correct. You can say, you can say something like that. Okay. I like them better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, we got some great responses to that. Let me repeat it for the camera. Judy was saying that if those two people get in conversation and, and it's brought up, it, you, you emphasize that there was a strategy behind that decision. Okay. Um, and tell me your first name? Cliff. And Cliff says, I like them better. <laughs> um, and there, there might be some ways to incorporate that even. I mean, in a, in a more professional tone, but um, 
off to the side and maybe maybe we can chat after the session. I'm not so sure that offering a sliding scale is in your best interest. Uh, raise of hands. How many people bill by the hour? Stop it. Yes. Just stop it. It is not in your best interest and it is not in the client's best interest and we can talk about that in the hallway, okay? Just stop it. Um, yes, you need to have a sense of how much time it's going to take you to get something done, but don't quote them a dollar and a quarter and then show them that it took you 50 hours to do it. Just stop it, okay? Uh, make, incorporating these changes is hard work. It, and I don't mean to imply that it is not hard work. I'm, I know that I'm being very glib with my responses, but you have to be introspective. You have to figure out who you are and why you're doing what you do and what brings you the greatest joy and then attract those clients, okay? I have no idea what time it is, okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I had to go back. Okay, what am I? It, yeah. Tell me your first name. Sheila. Sheila wants to know what are my top three CYA? CYOA. Cover your own. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. As, yes. Okay. How I protect myself? Um, I don't know what my top three are, but things like this proposal is good for X number of days. Okay, in my retainer packages, depending on what level they come in on, and now they're purchasing a package at a different level, which is very different than a sliding rate, okay? At this particular package level, I offer X number of unlimited 30-minute tasks, and I define what I mean by task. It means update your content, not update, Edit your content. I'll go in and change a paragraph for you if you send me that paragraph, okay, or a technical issue. So I try to be very, very clear about what I will and will not do. Um, how many times can somebody come back with change my logo? Yeah, n n not too damn many, right? Judy? That would be scope creep and logo development fee. Yeah. One, one of my favorite things to say when I'm developing out the scope of work is to say, based on the budget we've discussed, we will table that for phase two, okay? Um, most of my contract is short and sweet, nitty gritty. It's there not to cover all, all situations, but to cover a lot of them, <coughs> and it's to give the client a sense of, no, I didn't there give the client any damn thing. It's there so that I can come back and later say, according to the terms of our contract, which you have signed, blah, blah, blah. Does that help? Yes. Okay, Josh, you had a question? Yeah, for what I do, people, they don't understand it, the nitty gritty how it works in there. Where does education come into? Play for what I do. I do Google advertising. So. In the beginning, it starts in that first conversation with your client where you are delving deeply and you're and you, I like to be honest with them. I know that your expectations are different. I know that you want to be on page one of Google day after tomorrow for 500 bucks. I know that. And one of the things people Right. Well, it, it, it does go over people's head, but you know what? I take my car to a mechanic and I do not question what they bill me. I might grumble about it. I may shop for mechanics, but now that I have found a mechanic that I know and trust over several years, I don't care if they tell me this thing connects to that thing and how it works over here. I know that I will drive out and my automobile will be improved. 
Clients don't care about what we do and how we do it. They don't. They never will. You don't care how Amazon ships your stuff to you. They, you just want it on your doorstep day after tomorrow, right? You don't care what they do, how they send it, how they process it, what truck it gets on. Do they ship it to Atlanta and then it comes? Or do they send it by carrier pigeon? You just want it on your doorstep day after tomorrow, right? That's the way your clients operate too. They don't care about you, which is not the same as saying they don't respect what you do. Okay, they don't care how you get the job done. They want to solve, you to solve their problem. And in order to solve your problem, the most efficient and successful way, I need to do a lot of things. And that is going to cost you a lot of things. And stand firm behind that. This is what I need to do to solve your problem problem. And if you cannot live with that nicely, then you need to go away. You just, I can't, I can't work for you. That is somebody expecting unrealistic solutions for something you cannot deliver at that price. Anything else? I know I need to wrap up. Judy. I have two questions. First one, um, can we find out where we can find these slides afterwards? Yes, it's very, very easy. Um, it's... After the whole thing, uh, after every talk, uh, we will post that stuff. It, this happens to be a Google slide presentation, but I can't just say go to slides.google.com because you won't find me. You know, but they will be available uh, because there's content in the slides that is helpful. And, and it will be attached to the website under my name. So like if you, uh -huh, like if you go to this session, don't go today because I will put my organizer hat back on right after this. Um, I will put that direct link in and it will show up. That's the way it's supposed to work. I don't know about that because I can't control everybody. Okay. Ah. I yes. A lot of the speakers will tweet it out, and I will do that. And I, um, I will tweet the direct link to these slides for you. But I will also add it to um, the session. There's a place to do that, and it is supposed to then show up as a link. When, like you could go look at this session topic today and see blah, blah, blah. And there's, it should then appear a link somewhere. The second question was about the contract. Uh -huh. Where did you initially get your contract to develop and, and maintain? I mean, that's a magical document. It is a magical document. And to be honest with you, the, the first contract I did, um, a speaker was talking in Birmingham, Alabama. And God, Nathan, what is her name? Nathan's not in the back anymore. But anyway, she was doing a talk on contracts and she shared hers. And I took it and I ran with it and edited it. Over time, I now have done that with various people who are in this line of business who will gladly share their contract to get you started. You can also just Google it, uh, freelance contracts. And that will give you some basic clauses and things, boilerplate language. Make a list of the issues that give you grief, and then you will learn to write some, some phrases in your contract related to that. Uh, you can hear all this noise out in the hall. That means lunch has started. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we need to end. And